Hello, I'm John Anderson, president of the National Academy of Engineering, and I'm here today with Dr. John Brooks Slaughter, pioneer in engineering education and engineering profession. John, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, John, yes. glad to be here. I, we'd like to hear about your experiences uh, throughout your career, which has been very distinguished. I'd like to start with uh, what it was like in Kansas when you were growing up, going to high school in Topeka, Kansas. Well, Topeka at the time when, when I was growing up was a place that was still pretty much segregated in many ways, not just in the schools, but um, we were not allowed, African Americans were not allowed to um, go into any of the restaurants downtown or the hotels, it was a um, large swimming pool um, in Topeka. Um, and so we had to, uh, to adjust our lives to the fact that uh, there were things that we were not going to be able to do. Um, but I think it also provided us an opportunity to develop uh, some resolve uh, that was necessary to, to be able to, to uh, survive and be uh, productive in that environment. That, that's interesting, uh, this developing the resolve and the commitment that needed to even go beyond what other people have to do to get, to get what you, you desire. Now you were there, uh, you graduated I think in 1951 uh, from a, a high school in T Topeka which was segregated, but that's the year that the original lawsuit of Brown versus the public education of Topeka was filed. That's correct. And it was, it was uh, heard by the Supreme Court in 1954. What is your familiarity with that period? You were right there at ground zero when it was started. Yeah, and I was fully aware of the onset of the uh, Brown versus Board of Education case. I had the um, good fortune of being, um, uh, having a cousin, uh, Lucinda Todd, who really was the seminal figure in the uh, creation of the, the uh, instigation of the lawsuit. And Cindy, as we called her, because she was somewhat older than my sisters and I. Um, and Cindy uh, invited Thurgood Marshall to come to Topeka. Uh, he would come in disguise um, because he didn't want to be recognized by the, by the community because they would have been uh, totally opposed to uh, having you know, Thurgood Marshall in their vicinity. So he stayed at my aunt's home and uh, um, she would invite uh, a number of the, the African American community to come meet with him about uh, the, the, uh, the case. Um, and Cindy was the, really the first person who attempted to get her daughter enrolled in uh, um, the, one of the elementary schools. And uh, um, that was denied, and that's why she began this, began this effort. Um, Thurgood Marshall decided uh, to name the case after Oliver Brown rather than um, and Cindy because he felt uh, that um, um, the Brown daughter, Linda Brown, had a stronger um, argument uh, for the, the difficulty of uh, going to school. So um, we followed the case very closely because Aunt Cindy would come to our home almost every Sunday. And, and tell us what was going on. Yeah. That's one of the most important cases ever decided by the Supreme Court. Um, Thurgood Marshall, of course, argued the case in front of the Supreme yes. Court. Uh, and it was, uh, the, it was a 9-0 decision, as I recall, That's right. in 1954. And that made, had a huge benefit uh, in education in the United States for all our citizens, and, and uh, remarkable. And you were there uh, for that. Now, you uh, went to Kansas State yes. afterwards. How many of your classroom, uh, classmates were, were black and uh, how were you treated there as a major in engineering, electrical engineering, I think? 
Well, I had no black classmates. Uh, uh, I was the only African American in my graduating class. I think there was one, maybe two other uh, black students in engineering, but, but that was it at that time. Uh, um, uh, we were just not just not present. Um, I enjoyed Kansas State. I had no problem at all with with my fellow classmates. The very first day I was at, at uh, K-State, I remember going with m one of my white roommates to a restaurant um, for lunch the very first day. And um, I was denied um, uh, entrance to the restaurant. When I went back to my dormitory, I, <clears throat> I wrote a letter um, to the, the uh, school newspaper um, saying that I thought that that was just not consistent with what a university should do. So on my first day, I became a rebel, I think. You were first year, a first-year freshman student then? Uh, no, I, I was a, <clears throat> I had gone to um, Washburn University in, uh, in Topeka to take a lot of the classes that I should have had in high school. Yeah, cool. When I went to high school, I was um, funneled into a vocational track, um, being unaware that uh, um, I was not going to be able to pursue a full academic uh, um, curriculum. And so when I graduated from high school, I had good grades, but I didn't have the uh, science and mathematics that I needed to be able to go to K-State. So you, you got your bachelor's degree at, K at Kansas State yes. in electrical engineering. Yes. Um, and, and then you uh, uh, went to work, I think, for an electronics company, is that I true? went to work for Condor the, and General Dynamics, the aircraft company. General Dynamics. You know, there's a lot, all those obstacles, uh, you made a comment to me about how it strengthens your resolve and your determination. Maybe, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, what effect these barriers had on you, and yet you were able to uh, get past them and excel. John, my, my parents never let my sisters and I believe that we were inferior in any way. So I always had the feeling that I could accomplish anything that anyone else could. Um, and if I ran into a barrier, uh, it just uh, strengthened my, my commitment to overcoming it, to prove to people that, that uh, I was as good as anyone else. That's Terrific advice that you just basically gave young people too, uh, with that resolve uh, and uh, that determination that uh, would would benefit all of us if if we had that. Uh, you then, after uh, graduation, you you uh, worked at the um, uh, at University of California. Uh, was it at the electronics laboratory? Yes, naval lab, naval lab, Navy electronics laboratory. After. Uh -huh. uh, after after a few years at Convair, I decided that I really wanted to get more involved in electronics. I didn't have the opportunity to do that before. And I became committed to control system theory um, because of one of the classes I took as, um, in getting my master's degree. And uh, that became my passion. Yes. And you went on for... PhD degree in that area, right? Yes, that's correct. At, at, at University of California, San Diego, was yes. it? Yes. Yes. And um, then, as I understand it, you, uh, after you had worked for quite a number of years at the Naval Laboratory, that you moved to uh, Washington State to be a faculty member and an and a, a administrative leader. From the Navy Electronics Laboratory, I was offered the opportunity to become director of the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington. Oh. Um, and it was there that uh, um, I became um, uh, noticed by the National Science Foundation and was asked to 
by Richard Atkinson, the director, yes. to uh, to uh, take on the position of assistant director of uh, astronomics, atmospheric, earth, and ocean sciences, which I call the heaven and earth directory. <laughs> that's that's quite a move. Uh, Geographically, uh, yes, it was from, from Seattle all the way to, to Washington D.C. and then from a, a very uh, secure, good position you had at, at the Applied Physics Laboratory yes. all the way over there. Uh, what was your thinking then about going to the National Science Foundation and being assistant director? I had no intention to do so until I was asked by William Nirenberg, who was the director of Scripps Oceanography Institute in La Jolla to uh, consider that position. And uh, after discussing it with my family, wife, and children, we decided that uh, an experience in Washington would be, would be a good thing to do. So uh, um, we took a risk because uh, uh, at the time, the government didn't pay for travel. And uh, so we had to pay for our expenses for moving and b buying a new house and and so forth. But it was worth it. it, it, it in the long run, it was a good move for yes. the family then as well. And uh, you went then from the assistant director uh, position to the director of NSF. I went to Washington State. Oh, in between that. In between. Yes. And I was only at Washington State for for uh, less than two years when I received uh, uh, inquiries from the White House to come back to, to uh, serve as a director. And uh, I resisted it for a long time and, until I got a phone call from President Carter himself who, <laughs> who, who uh, encouraged me to, yeah. to accept him. Uh, I was shocked. Um, um, and uh, he said, I understand you're reluctant to, to uh, uh, come back to Washington as director. I said, uh, yes, sir, I uh, am. And he said, well, I want you to know you're my choice. And uh, that, that convinced me that, uh, that, was, that I would do so. The directorship is a presidential appointment yeah. with confirmation by Senate, right? So. Both of them are. Assistant director is as well. Both of them, yes. yes. So you must have done a pretty good job to, to, to get that, <laughs> that done. It was a difficult time, John, because um, this was toward the end of Carter's uh, presidency. And the uh, Republican Party all, all, was already convinced that, uh, that uh, um, he would be defeated. And, uh, so I hesitated to, to go until I had a commitment from the uh, president, whether it was Carter or Reagan, uh, uh, that I would be uh, secured in that position. So I waited until the, the uh, uh, Senate uh, did confirm me. I, was, I think I was the last uh, non-Republican to be, to be <laughs> confirmed by the Senate before Reagan. Um, but I had uh, I had some good relationships with some of the the uh, Republican senators, and so they confirmed me yeah. as a director. Now, now, something that happened when you were director of the National Science Foundation that's very important to the engineering field is that you established the Directorate of Engineering, which did not exist before that. It was a, a division, I think, yes. under. Talk a little bit about uh, the rationale for that and, uh, and some of the uh, administrative uh, things you had to do to get that done. The, uh, <clears throat> the beginning of the effort for uh, creating an engineering director was actually under Dick Atkinson when, when, he, was, when he was director. Uh, I participated with him in discussions with the engineering community. We met with a number of engineering leaders, uh, deans, uh, and uh, uh, engineering officials at uh, corporations, um, and talked about the, the importance of a higher um, 
recognition of engineering in the in the uh, um, in, in the foundation, um, and with the National Science Board, um, we were able to get uh, them to uh, be committed to the idea of creating a new a new directory. Um, the directory was established, uh, um, I think, uh, just about a year after I became uh, head of the uh, of the foundation, and uh, we. Um, we're very pleased that we were able to get backing of the Congress um, as well as the, the uh, engineering community for, for establishing it. So it has become uh, truly a, a significant uh, addition mm -hmm. to uh, the uh, National Science Foundation. And it had a lot to do with elevating the profession too to yes. its proper place as, a, as an equal. In, uh, with science, and I think shortly after that, the Directorate for Computer Science and Information Science, we call it SICE now, was was developed, That's uh, correct. W was initiated as well, which is very engineering oriented. So, and those two directorates uh, are uh, among the most active in the. In the in They've the made a marked difference um, in the. Uh, programs of the foundation, and uh, they really rounded it out. Uh, the scientific community was, was not always um, uh, supportive of the idea of breaking engineering out of MPSE, mm -hmm. mathematics, physical science, and engineering. But uh, um, after we had done that, they, uh, we had strong support even from scientific leaders. Yeah, well, you know what they say, change is good, you go first. So, yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly so it takes, uh, more, you deserve the credit for, for shepherding that through and, and, and uh, making it happen, and we're all better off for it. Now, right after you were director, you went to become a university president, right? Yes. Could you tell us about that? John, one of the things that I faced at the night at the National Science Foundation as director was dealing with the fact that the um, Reagan administration had um, abolished support for uh, science education and the um, social sciences. Um, and I was very concerned about that. I spent a lot of time uh, attempting to uh, get them to change that, that view because I thought that science education was critically important. We failed to, to uh, get, get them to change it and I um, went before the Congress and, and uh, violated uh, the guidance that I had received from OMB and it, rather than uh, supporting the idea of, re of abolishment of uh, science education, I argued for it. And I knew then that I w had really uh, crossed the line and that uh, this, that was uh, not going to be acceptable. So I was open to the idea when I was approached by the University of Maryland to uh, um, consider the chancellorship position. I was at so I was asked to um, do the commencement speech at the university in May of 1982. And at that time, the um, chair of the Board of Regents approached me um, and made an offer for me to come to the university. Um, and I realized that it was time for me to make that change because I had uh, um, resisted the the uh, efforts to eliminate uh, science education and, and the uh, uh, behavioral and social sciences at the foundation. Um, and that really was the impetus for, for making the change. Well, then you were at uh, the University of Maryland as president or chancellor of the term uh, 
for how long? For six years. six years. Did you go directly from there to Occidental? I did. Yeah, and then you became president of Occidental. That's correct. College, in, which is close to where, to, uh, where we are now. Exactly. And uh, how many years were you president at Occidental? 11 years 11 as president years. of Occidental. Mm -hmm. So that's 17 years of being a university president. It's a long yes. time. Yes, it is. And, uh, but it was a very enjoyable experience. I, I had uh, um, some challenges uh, uh, at both institutions. I was chancellor at Maryland when Leonard Bias, a basketball player, oh. um, died from a cocaine overdose. And the impact that had on the university was truly significant. Um, and we had to undergo a number of changes uh, that made us a, a better institution academically and, and in terms of the manner in which we um, handled our ath athletic program. Um, that was a, a, a very difficult, uh, difficult period to, uh, managing the, the, uh, the institution in the face of a lot of uh, public um, notoriety. But when I, I came to Occidental, largely because, John, I, I was convinced that undergraduate education was um, um, so critical um, and that too many of the large universities um, spent more focus on research and graduate education than they did on preparing undergraduates. Um, and Occidental, of course, is an undergraduate institution. And uh, when I received the opportunity to go to Occidental, um, it, it was uh, um, something that I ultimately decided to do. Mm -hmm. I had been invited to, um, by uh, an Ivy League institution um, to, to consider um, uh, presidency, um, but it became very clear to me during the process that uh, they were more interested in, or at least the, some members of their board uh, who were involved in the search were more interested in being able to demonstrate that they were uh, willing to consider uh, uh, an African American for the presidency than than they were in really committed to being committed to to uh, uh, to hiring one, um, and so when I was approached by Occidental, I was somewhat reluctant to do so, thinking that I that might undergo the same experience. But uh, uh, they made it very clear to me that they were serious. I became it became really the best 11 years of my professional career. Well, being president 11 years or even six years at a university is an achievement because it's, there are always the challenges. Yes. Every, at every university, the president must face those challenges, so you, you clearly uh, succeeded in getting through them and improving the two universities. Can you talk about um, what aspects of your engineering background, education and practice, uh, it would help you be a leader, an academic leader like that? Yeah, and I have to go back to, to my experience after I got out of high school when I, um, as I said earlier, I did not have the um, background to, to go into engineering immediately. And so I went to um, Washburn University, which is a, a small liberal arts college in my in my hometown, on a, where I took the math and chemistry and, and uh, other sciences. But I also had an opportunity to take a lot of liberal arts courses. Um, I took economics and speech and psychiatry and uh, psychology rather, um, and uh, uh, history of. English literature, and I became somewhat more well-rounded than most students who go directly into engineering. And I didn't realize it at the time, but 
that background was the best preparation for me to become president of a liberal arts college. Yes. Um, and I think, um, had I not done that, uh, um, had not had that experience, it would have been, been more difficult. The biggest problem I had at the University of Maryland initially was proving to um, the humanities and social sciences faculty that, that uh, I understood uh, what they were going through. And you respected what they were doing. That's right. And I think that's a, a key issue we bring. And I think we've seen in the last 20, 25 years, especially with ABET changes, that we've opened up the curriculum in engineering, allowing yes. students to do that with more free electives. We don't have to uh, pound so many technical courses into it. Exactly. We learn a lot on the job. And uh, so it's consistent with the direction we've moved in education. Exactly. Uh, there. And of course, we're working hard, and you've worked extremely hard uh, on behalf of uh, minorities uh, to, to uh, take advantage of our educational enterprise and advance the careers. And in, that has resulted in, in a better country, in my opinion, and uh, we're all societies uh, involved. One organization that I am impressed with in terms of their ability to bring more of our society into the engineering field is NACME, which is the National Action Council for Minority Engineering. Yes. And you played a role in all that, I know, at the beginning, and you, uh, National Academy of Engineering also played a role in its formation, yes. led by a person in industry. You can talk a little bit maybe about that. But over the years, NACME has been a strong supporter of undergraduate engineering education yes. for minorities. Maybe, and you were the, I believe, the executive director for almost a decade of a, that organization. President and CEO was the title. Yes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about NACME and its, its impact in engineering education? John, I learned a, a lot when I was uh, president at Occidental about um, how to encourage undergraduates to pursue fields in science and engineering. Um, we were really leaders in, in what is now called DEI. Um, we committed ourselves back in 1988 to become a more diverse educational community at Occidental. And we focused on um, creating opportunities for young people to, um, particularly uh, minorities, to, to uh, become involved in, in uh, science and engineering programs. We did not have an engineering program, but we prepared students who ultimately would come to Caltech because we had a, an arrangement with Caltech to uh, take our, our uh, undergraduates after two years and, uh, and put them into an engineering program. And it turned out that our students uh, were as successful and make, in many cases more successful as a result of the back, fact that they had uh, some liberal arts background as well. When I went to NACME, uh, I was very concerned about the fact that, that we waited too late, in my opinion, to, to get students um, interested in engineering. And so we established a pre-engineering program um, in, the, in the high schools um, and began to, to um, get them involved in engineering thinking at an earlier age. And that's the biggest change that uh, we introduced at, at, uh, at NACME beginning in the year 2000. Um, and I think that uh, has now led to um, a much more successful program and a greater increase in the number of students who are now doing, uh, minority students who are now um, engaged in engineering programs. So I'm very proud of the fact that uh, NACME has, uh, has made a huge difference. Yeah, so as I've said, I'm very impressed with that program over several decades, going yes. back to the 70s, and uh, you were certainly 
very important to the, to the program. Uh, and I think we, we lose sight of the fact sometimes that people can come to engineering from different avenues. They don't have to directly enter a four-year exactly. college. I think uh, uh, at Illinois Institute of Technology, where I was president, we, we had almost 25% uh, of our class come from community colleges. Mm -hmm. The students were very good and motivated, and I think it, it's more accessible to a greater fraction of our population yes. there. And these two, I think is a two, three program was kind of the one you're talking about exactly. with Occidental and Caltech. Exactly. I mean, going from Occidental to Caltech, that's a, a really an a, a, a advantage for those students and an opportunity. Talking about opportunities too, you um, gave a great lecture at the very first engineering and society lecture we had in 2020. Unfortunately, it was done during COVID. We, it was a virtual meeting, yeah. and that was too bad because it's hard to get, difficult to get a question and answer period yes. going. But I think that the theme was, let's not leave talent on the table, something yes. like that, that you, a quote from you. Uh, and that, so that's, that's kind of a culmination of all your ideas over the years, it seemed to me, and a rallying cry for, for all of us uh, in the engineering profession and the science profession, yes. STEM in general, to, uh, to try to reach all, all areas of our society. Uh, any advice for the National Academy of Engineering? Not for me, but for the National Academy of Engineering uh, going forward, uh, what do you think we should do? Well, John, just, if you recall, during, my, during that speech that you referred to, uh, I suggested that the engineering community become much more involved in, in social justice. During the time I served on the council. Um, That's I, the NAE council. NAE council, yes. I remember I, I tried to encourage an initiative uh, um, that would uh, bring the historically black colleges and universities more um, involved in in the academy, but I didn't have the the support that now exists. The, uh, the NAE is is uh, playing a major role. Has an opportunity to e even do more uh, in terms of helping the engineering community understand the importance of being involved in um, much of the. Uh, social um, 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 environment in which we find ourselves in 2023. Um, after the uh, George Floyd uh, incident, when um, I think the nation became more uh, uh, understanding of, of uh, uh, many of the issues that face the minority community, um, um, I'm very proud of the fact that, um, in, that the National Academy of Engineering has uh, stepped up under your leadership to, uh, to make a difference. And uh, the committee that you established uh, uh, that's led by Percy Pierre has uh, made some um, significant contributions to uh, uh, improving the the uh, uh, relationship, the connection of minorities to to the field of engineering. It is critically important that we we uh, we have uh, um, a strong um, um, public recognition, public involvement um, in. Uh, helping us improve the social condition of, the, of, the, of this country. Uh, I'm optimistic, actually, that uh, we'll be able to do that. As Martin Luther King uh, said so clearly, as truth crushed earth, uh, will rise again. And I believe that will happen. Uh, well, well it, it, you know, the, the NACME's been doing a great job and should continue, and the responsibility also rests on the National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Science, National Academy of Medicine yes. uh, to make sure that uh, th that we keep the pressure on moving ahead to engage 
all our citizens and giving and letting talent meet opportunity yes. everywhere. Yes, all right. exactly. I, um, the economies have an opportunity to to be leaders in in these fields, and uh, um, I think that that would be critical. I, I, w I want to see the the, uh, the academies be at the forefront of these efforts. I, you know, with the I thought about the recent decision to by the Supreme Court on affirmative action, and uh, I've always said to um, leaders of organizations that uh, while we may not have affirmative action, we can still act affirmatively, and uh, I believe that very strongly. I like that phrase, and I agree with you completely uh, that, we, that much can still be done through leadership. In fact, leadership is the important part That's of it, right. not the law. That's yes. I think that uh, going forward, the whole field uh, needs to become much more knowledgeable of the uh, humanities. Uh, and so uh, I taught a course uh, at USC on technology and society, and it really opened my eyes to how uh, engineering um, can play a significant part in uh, how we improve the social condition of, of our nation. So uh, that would be what I would suggest going forward, a, a, a greater uh, connection to the humanities and the social sciences um, in engineering. Well, I, I hear that, and uh, I, I'm sure my peers will, will uh, resonate with that as well. I totally agree with what you're saying. And that committee needs to keep moving and keep doing things. You've been part of that committee. You've done a lot uh, by both participating and by being a model for what you were a pioneer. We need pioneers, people that break new ground, and we'll be doing that. So I will carry that forward. Um, I want to uh, end by um, just thanking you for all you've done. I mean. I first uh, knew about you when I was assistant professor at Cornell. I, for some reason, I, uh, you've been one of the people I've looked up to. I want to thank you for all you've done for me and for others. And appreciate it. And well, thank you, John. I, I uh, am honored and humbled that you um, invited me to do this. It's, uh, really appreciate it. Well, your words are heard. Thank you very much.